That concludes general questions. We'll turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the bill passed by opposition parties in the House of Commons yesterday uh, once again seeks to delay the decision to leave the European Union. It gives the UK until October the 19th to get a deal with the European Union. Now, I still hope we and the other 27 countries in the EU can reach an agreement, does the First Minister. First Minister. Well, I'm going to tell Jackson Carlow firstly, uh, something that I think he should know by now. I don't want to see Scotland have to leave the European Union no. at all. And there's a simple democratic reason for that. Scotland did not vote to leave the European Union. And I think any self-respecting uh, Scottish politician <coughs> would actually stand up uh, for what people in Scotland voted for in the EU referendum. But secondly, you know, we hear all of uh, this talk from Boris Johnson about trying to get a deal. Uh, but I think we've also seen in uh, the past couple of days uh, the evidence that suggests very, very strongly that there is no meaningful negotiation no, no. ongoing right now. No, no. Uh, sham is the word that has been uh, used about it and I think actually attributed, uh, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, uh, to a member of the Prime Minister's own uh, inner circle. So if uh, Jackson Carlow is privy to information that the rest of us don't have and can tell us right now the detail of the deal that Boris Johnson is trying to strike with the European Union, then perhaps he'd share that with us and we'd all have the opportunity to give our views on it. Jackson Carlow. That doesn't sound like the First Minister is very interested in an agreement. And yet this is... <laughs> and yet this... And yet this is the bill your MPs voted for last night, First Minister. It gives a deadline of the 19th of October to negotiate an orderly exit, something which I think would deliver what most people in Britain want, which is to go on with delivering Brexit in line with the referendum decision we took. So I ask again, does she actually want a deal or not? First Minister. I don't want, and let me just say this, uh, I can't say it any more simpler, so I'll try and say it a bit more slowly and perhaps a bit more loudly. I don't want Scotland to leave the European yeah. Union yeah. because 62% of people in Scotland voted uh, against leaving the European Union and I, I guess if that uh, vote was held again today, that percentage would be even higher. But I come back to the point of a deal. If Jackson Carlow is asking me to give an opinion on some mythical deal that he believes, unlike most other people, that Boris Johnson uh, is on the verge of agreeing with the European Union, then tell us what he thinks the content of that deal is, and then I will happily give him an opinion on it. But right now, uh, there are no negotiations that we know of. Uh, the efforts, uh, so-called efforts to uh, strike a deal have been described as a sham. The European Union don't appear to know of the negotiations that are making progress the way uh, Boris Johnson tries to tell us. So, Clearly, Jackson Carlow is suggesting he knows something that the rest of us uh, don't know. So share it with us now, and then we can have a meaningful discussion about it. Jackson Carlow. Well, let's spell it out. The First Minister doesn't really want to see successful negotiations between the UK and the EU. She's just said as much. She wants the negotiations to fail. It's not in her interest to strengthen the UK's hand in those talks. She wants to weaken the UK's hand in those talks. She doesn't, want, she doesn't want people in Scotland to be able to move on from this. She's determined to keep it dragging on and on and on. Yeah. Isn't it the case that when it comes to this First Minister, she's never seen a referendum result she doesn't want to overturn? Yeah. First Minister. I want to overturn the Brexit Scottish referendum result. Uh, I want to see it honoured. People yeah. in Scotland voted to remain in the EU. But, you know, I'd say gently to to Jackson Carlow, had the Tories, Theresa May in particular, perhaps been willing to listen from as far back as December 2016, when we published, the Scottish Government published Scotland's Place in Europe, which said expressly that notwithstanding our opposition to Brexit, yep. uh, we put forward the compromise option of single market and customs union membership. We put that on the table as a potential compromise option, and it was completely disregarded. Uh, had the Tories and Ruth Davidson uh, once challenged me to support continued single market membership and then uh, when our Westminster bosses told her that that wasn't the policy decided otherwise. So uh, I'll take no uh, lessons from Jackson Carlaw on attempting to find compromise on Brexit. Uh, but we are in the position now where uh, I'll say again, I don't want Scotland to be dragged out of the European Union against 
our will. Uh, but I absolutely will not stand by uh, while we have a no-deal exit imposed upon us because I know how catastrophic that will be. And let me end by just a, a challenge on this to Jackson Carlow and the Conservatives. This afternoon in this chamber, we all have the opportunity to say that a no-deal exit is unacceptable in all circumstances. I'll be voting for that. My colleagues will be voting for that. Will Jackson Carlow be voting for that? Jackson Carlow. First Minister, we respect the results of all referendums. You should give it a try. Yeah. Presiding officer, perhaps there is one thing we can agree on here, that it may now require a general election to sort this out. First Minister, Scottish Conservatives will stand up for and stand by our decision to remain within the United Kingdom. <laughs> to back the decision people made across the UK to leave the European Union to ensure this country can move on. If you want more years of division, vote for Nicola Sturgeon. If you want to get back to the things that matter, schools, jobs, police, the people's business, vote for us. That is the clear choice that Scotland now faces. Yeah. First Minister. Do you know what? I, I, I can't help thinking that if the Conservatives had any confidence whatsoever in that message, Ruth Davidson would still be standing right now where Jackson Carlow is. She can't, she can't stomach the direction Boris Johnson is taking this country in. Boris Johnson's own brother can't <laughs> stomach the direction he's taking the country in. The question is, why should the people of Scotland be forced to put up with it? So I relish the prospect of a general election. I really relish the prospect of a general election. Uh, the SNP will beat the Tories in a general election, just as we have done in the past number of elections. And unashamedly and unapologetically in that election, the message from the SNP will be clear. We stand up for Scotland's opposition to Brexit, and we stand up for Scotland having the right to choose our own future, not having a future imposed on us by Boris Johnson. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, to ask the First Minister what value she places on the freedom of the press. First Minister. I, I place huge value on the freedom of the press, as I hope every Democrat, every uh, member of uh, Parliament does. Uh, so perhaps uh, that's a note of consensus we'll be able to strike in this session. Richard Leonard. Um, well, let me examine a uh, recent event. On the 25th of August, the Sunday Mail published the shocking story of Alan Marshall, who died after being held in custody in Stockton Prison. At the fatal accident inquiry, the sheriff ruled that Alan's death was, and I quote, entirely preventable. When the Sunday Mail sought to shine a light on this in the public interest, Scottish ministers went to court in the middle of the night seeking an interdict in order to prevent this newspaper reaching the newsstands. The government's case collapsed and was dropped. The paper was published. Can the First Minister tell us when it was decided to serve the interdict to ban the publication of the Sunday Mail on the 25th of August? When did she become aware of the interdict being served? Did the First Minister authorise the legal action? Or was it the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, or was it both? Um, First it, Minister. It, it was neither. Um, this was a decision that was taken by the Scottish Prison Service, uh, and uh, the Scottish Prison Service later decided not to proceed with that action. Uh, in the circumstances, I think the decision not to proceed with that action uh, was the right decision. Um, can I say first and foremost, presiding officer, that uh, my condolences, as I'm sure the condolences of all of us, go to the family and friends of Alan Marshall. Um, when any individual is in the custody of the state, there are serious obligations that lie on the state to respect the dignity and the human rights of those individuals. Uh, when there are concerns raised, it is important that they are properly 
considered and scrutinised, and that is what it has and will continue to happen in this case. There has been a fatal accident inquiry. Uh, the outcome of that inquiry has led to a number of recommendations, which the Scottish Prison Service uh, are now considering fully, and they have a matter of weeks in which uh, they uh, can put forward their response. There's a number of other actions also uh, being taken by the Scottish Prison Service uh, to ensure that any lessons are learned in terms of the future policy uh, of uh, our prison service. So uh, that is the right way to proceed. None of that uh, takes away from the, the grief and anguish of the family of Alan Marshall. And my thoughts, as I said at the outset, uh, remain very much with them. Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, a, a week later, the Sunday Mail reported, and I quote them, it is understood Mr. Yusuf was informed at 11.30 p.m. on Saturday night. Lawyers acting for the Scottish Prison Service rejected attempts to resolve the matter out of court after that point. So let's be clear. Alan Marshall died following a shocking, a shocking incident in prison service custody. The sheriff says that his death was entirely preventable. And your government goes to court in the dead of night to keep this out of the public eye. Does the First Minister regret this heavy-handed interference in the freedom of the press? Will she apologise to members of Alan Marshall's family who are in the public gallery in Parliament today? And will the First Minister agree to a full independent investigation into her government's actions, including how much money was wasted, the role of the Justice Secretary and indeed her own role in this and will she publish the findings? First Minister. Firstly, I, I, had, I had no role in this. This was a, a decision by the Scottish Prison Service to initiate court action, a decision taken by the Scottish Prison Service eh, as employer to allow for a fuller consideration to be undertaken. The Scottish Prison Service then decided not to proceed with that action and I think that was the right decision. Uh, in terms of the CCTV footage, that of course was viewed by the Fatal Accident Inquiry. Um, I have since uh, viewed the CCTV footage in full. Uh, the uh, Justice Secretary has offered to meet uh, with Alan Marshall's family and uh, again I repeat my uh, deepest condolences to them. Uh, I take matters like this uh, extremely seriously uh, because I take very seriously the responsibilities of the state uh, when individuals are in custody. Their human rights uh, continue to require to be protected and respected. Uh, so therefore, in situations like this, if there are lessons to be learned, it is vital that they are learned. The fatal accident inquiry was a critical part of that. The further work that the Scottish Prison Service is undertaking, uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Prisons has been asked to oversee uh, that further work uh, so that any lessons that require to be learned are learned. Clearly, it is up to committees of this parliament if they want to do uh, further inquiries into uh, what happened here, and it's not for me to interfere with that. But uh, Richard Leonard should be under uh, no illusions about the seriousness with which uh, I and my government uh, take issues uh, like this one. We've got a few constituency supplementaries. The first from Jenny Gilruth. Presiding officer, on the 8th of August, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport travelled across the Forth to the magnificent Kingdom of Fife to announce that Leavens Railway is set to return after 50 years, confirming £75 million of investment from the Scottish Government to reopen the line. Will the First Minister join with me in congratulating the resolute dedication and commitment of the Leavenmouth Rail campaign? First Minister. Uh, absolutely. I uh, commend the commitment of stakeholders, including the Leavenmouth Rail Campaign, who engage with the Leavenmouth Sustainable uh, Transport Study. I would also pay tribute to Jenny Gilruth for her determination um, on this issue on behalf of her constituents. Um, from this study, of course, it emerged that the decision uh, to uh, reopen the rail link to Leavenmouth alongside new bus and active travel provision was uh, the right one. The study concluded that this integrated solution would be the best to meet the needs of people and businesses in the Leavenmouth area uh, and earlier this month the government instructed Network Rail to proceed with the next stages of design development. Uh, we've also committed an additional £5 million to a Leavenmouth blueprint fund available to partners to maximise the benefits of the government investment in the area and we very much look forward to working with Fife Council on that. Jeremy Balfour. I was uh, recently contacted by a constituent whose teenage daughter has been left waiting by NHS Lorraine over 35 weeks for CAMS treatment. 
Meanwhile, her mental health continues to deteriorate to the point that she's no longer able to attend school. The Scottish Government standard states that 90% of children and young people should be start treatment with 18 weeks. Would the First Minister agree this delay is unacceptable and will she intervene to ensure my constituent's daughter receives treatment immediately? First Minister. Uh, well, firstly, can I uh, thank Jeremy Bell for, for raising uh, this issue? Uh, yes, I, I do think weeks of that length are, are not acceptable if he wants to, uh, with his constituents' permission, share uh, her details uh, with me. I will ensure that the Health Secretary looks into uh, the case as a, a matter of urgency. Uh, we've said, I said uh, on Tuesday when I launched the programme for government again, that long waits for CAMs are not acceptable. That is why we have set out uh, a programme of work to reduce those waiting times, which includes additional investment, uh, but also includes uh, substantial reform of how we deliver services for young people who need mental health care and treatment. Uh, the wellbeing service that we are moving ahead to implement over uh, the next year is a crucial part of that, making sure that there are uh, early intervention and preventative services available. And that also then helps to ensure that specialist services are available for those who need them most. Uh, so this is uh, a programme of work that is extremely important and a priority for the government. But in the meantime, uh, we would be very happy, uh, I'd be very happy to have uh, Jean Freeman look into his constituents' case. Beatrice Wishart, to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's good to be here. During the by-election, the First Minister experienced firsthand the struggles people in Shetland have with capacity for freight, cabins and cars on our lifeline ferry service to Aberdeen. What are her priorities for action? First Minister. Well, can I, um, as I did on Tuesday, congratulate... Beatrice Wisher on her election success and welcome her to the Scottish Parliament. I wish her well in representing uh, the good people of Shetland. Can I also take this uh, opportunity to congratulate my party's candidate, Tom Wills, for an outstanding result in increasing the SNP share of the vote. He, um, and indeed uh, others in the by-election, put forward, uh, I think, some very sensible proposals for how we can continue the work of this government uh, to improve. Uh, ferry services in particular to the Northern Isles. Uh, I look forward to having discussions with uh, Beatrice Wisher and her colleagues as we get towards uh, the budget and perhaps I can also look forward to the support of Beatrice Wisher in the budget uh, when we continue to deliver for the people of Shetland uh, on all of these matters. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Maureen Ward. Jackie Bailey. The First Minister will be aware that Orkambi and Simkevi were both rejected by the Scottish Medicines Consortium on the 12th of August. She will also be aware that these life-changing drugs for cystic fibrosis sufferers were the subject of a long campaign by my constituent, Kelly Gallagher. Can the First Minister therefore advise the Chamber how she will ensure that Orkambi and Simkevi are available to all cystic fibrosis sufferers in Scotland? First Minister. Uh, well, can I firstly say that I, I want to get to a position where that is the case, and I, I hope Jackie Bailey recognises that. Uh, Jackie Bailey, I know, also recognises the fact that the Scottish Medicines Consortium takes decisions independently of ministers, uh, but as I also know she's aware, because I understand the Health Secretary has written to her about this and has uh, also agreed to meet her about this, we are continuing discussions with the manufacturers of these drugs to get to a position as quickly as possible uh, where they are routinely available to sufferers of cystic fibrosis, and I hope we would continue to have the support of Jackie Bailey and others across the chamber to make as much uh, progress as quickly as possible with the manufacturers. And Maureen Wood. Uh, in the light of Muller's decision to review its depot operations in Aberdeen South and North King Card in my constituency and potentially leading to closure and up to 50 job losses, can the First Minister confirm that the Scottish Government has offered the services of the PACE team and that has indeed been taken up? First Minister. Uh, well, can I uh, thank Maureen Watt for raising an issue that I know will be of significant concern to her constituents, uh, as uh, is the case in all of these situations where job losses uh, are a risk, then we do offer the services of the PACE team, and we will certainly do that in this case. I will ask the uh, Economy Minister to correspond directly with Maureen Watt uh, and keep her posted on the progress of discussions between the Scottish Government, the PACE team uh, and the company uh, here because first and foremost we always try to avert and avoid redundancies but where that is not possible for whatever reason we want to make sure the right support is available for affected workers. Question number three, Alison Johnson. Thank you. These are extraordinary times but the climate emergency can't wait. So I commend the Scottish Government for the small steps forward they've taken in their programme for government. 
But you have to do much more, and you have to do much more now. Last week, we launched our proposals for a Scottish Green New Deal, a transformative programme of change that contrasts with your lack of ambition. For example, we proposed that the hundreds of millions of pounds being spent on new roads be redirected into public transport and cycling and walking. An independent review of your own clean air strategy published last week supported this. Will you be bold, First Minister, and will you take funds out of new big road projects and invest them in public transport instead? First Minister. Well, yes, we will be bold. We were bold in the programme for government. I said that was not the sum total of our actions. We've got a number of pieces of work that will come forward over the next 12 months, all of which will form our comprehensive response to the climate emergency. Uh, but I would simply quote uh, WWF Scotland about the programme for government. Uh, this shows real leadership on the climate emergency. These commitments will slash emissions and deliver benefits to people and the Scottish environment now and for years to come. Uh, or Lord Debon, the chair of the Committee on Climate Change, Scotland has led the UK in reducing its emissions and has ambitions to lead the world in tackling climate change. That vision is alive and well. Scotland is serious about its commitment. That was a comment about the programme for government. So uh, I would say to Alison Johnson, I, I think it is right that the government, all governments, are challenged to do more and to do it faster. And we are up for that challenge. But I don't think it does the cause of which both and I uh, both her and I are, are committed to. I don't think it does the cause uh, any real justice to try to downplay the significance of what was announced in the programme for government. And instead, let's get behind it and work together uh, to see how we can do uh, more and do it even faster. Alison Johnson. We certainly can't get behind a government that freezes investment in cycling and walking in the face of a climate emergency. But it's not all about transport. Reforesting Scotland is a critical component of the Scottish Green New Deal. But even under your new plans, released this week, you reach your own modest target of 21% of Scotland being forested eight years late. You wouldn't reach the Scottish Greens target of 40%, the European average, for 150 years. There's no shortage of opportunity. Almost a fifth of Scotland is a grouse moor, burnt, degraded and managed so that a few people can enjoy blood sports. Will you be bold, First Minister, and carry out an urgent review of plans to really reforest Scotland to tackle the climate emergency? First Minister. Well, firstly, on uh, Grouse Moors, we've got the Weddington report coming in a few weeks' time. Uh, we also, in the programme for government, set out uh, proposals around uh, regional land use uh, partnerships uh, to look at how we use our land in a way that meets our climate ambitions. I mean, on forestry, I mean, I, I, I'm absolutely committed to see us increase our ambitions and the delivery of those ambitions on forestry. But let's just take a moment to uh, reflect on the fact that last year, uh, Scotland was responsible for 84, I think I'm getting that figure right, percent of all trees that were planted across the UK. We exceeded uh, the target that we had set last year. That's why we've increased it from 10 hectares, 10,000 hectares to 12,000 hectares with an additional five million pounds. So uh, there is no lack of ambition here. And on active travel, um, we doubled the active travel budget. So when you talk about freezing it, we're uh, maintaining it at <coughs> doubled levels. And I see the benefits of that in my own constituency and be happy to uh, talk to Alison Johnson more about the Glasgow South Way, which is uh, revolutionising active travel in my own constituency, which Patrick Harvey should be well aware, with, uh, well aware of. There's about 11 of these projects currently across the country. So we have set out bold plans. We will continue to do that. And even if the Greens can't uh, quite bring themselves uh, to admit this, all international experts, in fact, many experts in the UK and in Scotland, recognise that Scotland is actually leading the world. Thank you. We have some further supplementaries. The first from Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. 90% of parents responding to a recent survey blamed food promotions, such as buy one, get one free bog off, on increases in obesity, which is of concern, especially as one in, one in five, four and five-year-olds are obese. Will this week's announcement under the programme for government on a good food bill have scope to ban these? First Minister. 
Uh, well, I welcome the results of the survey that mm. Christine Graham cites. Time and again, we have seen surveys uh, like this one, which reaffirms uh, the need to take action to help families make healthier choices. Uh, the case for taking mandatory action has been made. This week's programme for government sets out our commitment to undertake a restricting foods promotions bill before the end of this parliamentary session. That is in addition to the Good Food Nation bill, which I think also gives us the opportunity to translate our excellence around food and drink produce into better diets uh, as a country. Uh, but there's no doubt that restricting point of sale junk food promotions that encourage overconsumption and impulse buying of junk foods has a very important role to play in meeting our target of halving childhood obesity by 2030. And Ross Greer to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Ross Greer. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government will be doing about the 39,100 empty homes across Scotland now that they've abandoned their manifesto commitment to introduce compulsory sale orders? First Minister. Well, as uh, I think Kevin Stewart outlined at uh, committee this week, uh, unfortunately, given uh, constraints on the legislative programme space uh, and particularly the potential implications of Brexit, uh, we have said that at this stage we don't expect to be in a position to progress a compulsory sale order in this parliamentary session, but we do remain committed to introducing that power for local authorities. There have been a number of issues and challenges with the current proposals that we have to think through a bit more, not least to make sure that any proposal is compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. Of course, uh, local authorities have other options. Many local authorities already use their compulsory purchase order powers to tackle empty homes. I think over the past three years, 13 CPOs have been submitted under housing legislation. All 13 were approved. Uh, nine involved the compulsory acquisition of empty homes in some form. So we will continue to work uh, closely with the Empty Homes Partnership to support authorities to use their existing powers as we continue to plan to introduce the new powers that we previously committed to. Murdo Fraser, to be followed by Emma Harper. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government has opened a consultation on the possible relocation of the Stone of Destiny from Edinburgh Castle to Perth, where it would form the centrepiece of a new cultural centre in Perth City Halls, a development of huge economic importance to Perth and the surrounding area. Can the First Minister tell me when a decision is likely to be made uh, in relation to the future of the Stone of Schoon? And would you agree with me it is time that the stone came home to Perthshire? First Minister. Uh, the Environment Secretary has uh, reminded me that I've got Perthshire MSPs surrounded me. Um, I, I hope, Murdo Fraser, he's put his case on the record. I hope he will understand that, not in actually in this case as First Minister, but as uh, one of the commissioners for the safeguarding of the regalia, uh, the commissioners who will take this decision. While that consultation is ongoing, it's very important that I don't express a view because the commissioners will have to look at the uh, outcome of the consultation and all of the other evidence and reach uh, a decision. I hope that decision is reached uh, uh, soon after the consultation ends, but uh, I'm sure Murdo Fraser will be pleased to have got his arguments on the record today. Emma Harper to be followed by Jenny Mara. Emma Harper. First Minister, at long last, the UK government is paying back the 160 million it stole from Scottish farmers. But despite rural payments being the responsibility of this government, who already said this cash will go straight to farmers, the UK government has sought to decree how this money should be ring fenced. In seeking to dictate to Holyrood on spending, doesn't this represent the thin edge? the thin end of the wedge and does the First Minister reject such attempts to erode the powers of this Parliament? First Minister. Um, yes, I agree very much with Emma Harper and um, thank you for raising this important issue. I welcome the fact that farmers at long last are getting back the money that was stolen, stolen. from them by a Conservative stolen. government. Uh, say, I mean, you just think about the logic of this. A Conservative government nicks this money from our farmers. It spends yeah. six years, six long years, refusing to give it back. And when finally it is shamed into having to do so, tries to claim credit for it. I mean, it is absolutely absurd. Shameless. So thankfully, the farmers will now get their money and this government will continue to do the right thing by Scotland's farmers. Jenny Mara. The First Minister will know that the Dundee Drugs Commission reported on the 16th of August. The report showed that the character of Dundee's drugs problem is different to the rest of Scotland in that there are more young people tragically dying, poly drug use is far more common and people who die are more likely to have lived in poverty. 
but the report was scathing of the NHS drug service. Isolated, unaccountable, maverick, punitive, and willfully ignoring national and regional best practice. This is directly under this government's control. How can the First Minister make the Dundee drug service better for our citizens and reduce the number of deaths? First Minister. Well, I very much welcome the work of the Drug Commission in Dundee. Uh, the Commission's work is obviously very important in the context of Dundee, and I think the points uh, made about the differing context in some circumstances are points that are well made and have to be uh, properly considered. Uh, but I also think that the recommendations in the Commission's report will also have a wider relevance uh, to Scotland more generally. Uh, the Minister for Public Health has met with the Chair of uh, the Dundee Commission already to discuss the report and we are considering the recommendations for government carefully. Obviously the recommendations will feed into the wider work uh, that the government is leading um, and has commissioned the, the New Drugs Task Force for example the additional funding that I announced earlier this week and of course the Minister for Public Health will make a statement to Parliament this afternoon updating uh, on this work and I'm sure uh, the contents of that will be of interest not just to Jenny Manor but to members across the chamber. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in response to Police Scotland figures that show that more than 160 people have reported being raped in the very early stages of dating in 2018-19. First Minister. Uh, all forms of violence against women and girls is a violation of human rights and must not be tolerated. Uh, I welcome Police Scotland's new campaign which seeks to tackle sexual violence head on and make it clear that sex without consent is always rape. Uh, we are working with schools, colleges, universities and employers to deliver prevention programmes through our Equally Safe strategy uh, and we're continuing to pilot a whole schools approach to tackling gender-based violence with Rape Crisis Scotland and Zero Tolerance. Uh, we're also supporting Rape Crisis Scotland's National Sexual Violence Prevention Programme which has been expanded to all Scottish local authorities. It is though only through tackling outdated attitudes in society that we can create the conditions for sexual violence to be reduced and ultimately eradicated which should be the aim of all of us. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank the First Minister for that reply. And, and I recognise that the, the Get Consent campaign is aimed primarily at men aged between 18 and 35, as this is the peak age for offending. But does the First Minister agree with me that informed discussions about sex and consent need to take place in school settings to try to prevent sexual crime in the first place? First Minister. Uh, yes, I agree very strongly with that, which is why the work I referred to in my earlier answer is so important. Um, education and prevention are the clear focus of the equally safe strategy for the reasons that Stuart McMillan uh, talked about. We want every child and young person in Scotland to develop mutually respectful, responsible and confident relationships with other children, young people and adults. Uh, this summer we published a resource for professionals that aims to help them support young people in their understanding of healthy relationships and consent. And in addition, national guidance for schools will be developed to set out the range of support and practical prevention and intervention measures available to ensure the safety and well-being of all children and young people. Question number five, Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government will take in response to the sectarian disorder in Glasgow at the weekend. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I take the opportunity to praise Police Scotland for the swift and effective way in which they managed an extremely difficult and challenging situation. Uh, this government uh, has been clear and will be, continue to be clear that the right to peaceful and lawful assembly is an important part of our democracy. But we will be equally clear that violent and sectarian disruption is not part of our democracy and should never, ever be tolerated. Uh, that's why the Justice Secretary is working with Glasgow City Council and Police Scotland to ensure that we do all we can to avoid this kind of behaviour being repeated. Uh, as we have already stated, we remain open to giving full consideration to any proposals to tackle sectarianism, in addition, of course, to the work that we're already undertaking and to working with all partners to eradicate the scourge of sectarianism from our society once and for all. Annie Wills. Thank you, First Minister, for that answer. I understand Police Scotland have advised this weekend's marches should go ahead, but that's because after last week's disgrace, they now think that people will turn up anyway. So we have to understand how we got here. How on earth did an SNP Glasgow City Council leader think it was a good idea to let a Republican march go through Govan on an old film weekend? 
Anyone in Glasgow could have told you that was a bad idea. So, First Minister, everyone here condemns the unacceptable behaviour that shamed our city last week. Do you think Susan Aitken was late, right to let that march go ahead? First Minister. Um, I tell you, Presiding Officer, what I think is a really, really bad idea, in fact, probably the worst idea of all in this context, and that is to try to turn an issue as serious as this into a party political bun fight the way Annie Wells. And I would, I would say, I would say to Annie Wells in all seriousness uh, that I think she should reflect very carefully Absolutely. on the content uh, and the tone of the question she has just asked. And I would perhaps suggest to the interim leader of the Scottish Conservatives that he might want to do likewise. This is not a party political issue. This is an issue long-standing, an issue that is a challenge, but one that we are determined to eradicate. Uh, first and foremost, the people responsible uh, for the outrageous and unacceptable scenes on the streets of Govan last Friday night uh, were the people that behaved in an unacceptable and violent and sectarian way. They are responsible. Glasgow City Council uh, operates within the law. Uh, they operate within the law on the basis of police uh, and other advice and they take the decisions uh, that they are advised are the right ones to take. Uh, the reason that we are discussing with Glasgow City Council is to develop an understanding as to whether uh, it is the view that changes to the law might be required, whether they have the powers they need within the existing law or whether changes are required. And that is a discussion we will continue to take forward in a responsible uh, way. Uh, we will also continue to invest heavily in projects and initiatives to tackle sectarianism. Uh, we opposed, of course, the repeal of the legislation in this chamber uh, that was trying to deal with this at football matches. I regret that the opposition parties uh, did repeal that, but Parliament took its decision. Uh, but above all, we will listen to and talk to anybody uh, to consider how we effectively deal with a societal problem, but one that has no place in modern Scotland. It is a scourge in our society. And actually, politicians who are serious about tackling it will come together so that we speak with one voice on it yeah. and not engage in the kind of tactics that Annie Wells has just disgracefully done. John Mason, to be followed by James Kelly. John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister may know that of the two marches planned for this Saturday, one is starting in my constituency and one is finishing there. Can she give any reassurance uh, to my constituents that they will be able to go about their normal lives on Saturday without being disrupted? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, citizens, uh, whether in John Mason's constituency, my constituency, in any constituency, have a right uh, to go about uh, their normal business uh, and I have a duty, we all have a duty, to stand up for the rights of law-abiding citizens in this context. Um, obviously, the two marches uh, that will take place in Glasgow this weekend uh, have been given approval. I strongly support Police Scotland to take the necessary action to facilitate these. Uh, I appeal to all involved to conduct themselves in an orderly manner and demonstrate uh, that the right to march and demonstrate can be exercised without being abused. Uh, there is already a strong framework of legislation in place, but as I just said to Annie Wells, we will look carefully at where improvements can be made. Uh, Dr Michael Rosie, an independent advisor, has been asked to review the implementation of the 2016 recommendations on marches, parades and static demonstrations uh, and will put forward proposals on what more may be needed. Uh, of course, legislation has an important part to play here, but it's not the only way to tackle these kinds of problems uh, and discussions that the Justice Secretary will have with the Council and with Police Scotland uh, will not be limited to looking just at legislative measures. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The scenes we witnessed in Govan on Friday night uh, are unacceptable and shocking. Bigotry and intolerance has no place in a modern progressive society. In reacting to those events, I think we all have a responsibility to be careful about our language and tone. Uh, in response to Lord McConnell's comments that more can be done to tackle sectarianism, can I ask the First Minister what has been done to work with parties across Parliament and with groups across Scotland to tackle bigotry and intolerance. First Minister. Well, Lord McConnell, to, in one respect, is right. Uh, it is self-evident when we see the kind of scenes that we saw on Friday night that more needs to be done. 
There's a responsibility first and foremost on government working with councils, but I think there's a responsibility, which I'm glad to hear James Kelly uh, agree with, a responsibility on all of us. This is an issue where uh, cross-party and non-political leadership is needed. We invest heavily. We've increased uh, the funding going to anti-sectarian education projects in schools, prisons, workplaces and communities and we will continue to do that. We'll continue to work with those who are doing very uh, good work around this. Um, I, James Kelly said that he wants to work uh, with us. I, I welcome that. I, I recall uh, when uh, the football legislation was being repealed that James Kelly said that he was going to be developing an anti-sectarianism sectarianism strategy uh, fit for 2018. Now, I'm not aware of him having brought that forward yet, but I give him an open offer today. If he does, we will consider that in addition to the work we are already doing and the further work we are considering doing, because I do believe this is something that we should come together to tackle. So if James Kelly wants to bring these uh, proposals forward, I'm happy to give him an assurance today that we will consider them fully. Question number six, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recent disruption on ScotRail services. First Minister. Uh, the overall reliability of ScotRail services has improved this year. For example, the number of train crew related cancellations has reduced by 91%. Uh, that said, the recent disruption to services, including on the last weekend of the Edinburgh Festival, where passengers were significantly inconvenienced due to services being overwhelmed uh, by demand, was clearly unacceptable and lessons must be learned from that. Uh, a review by ScotRail Alliance is currently underway to identify actions that will strengthen planning for future events. Colin Smith. In March, the First Minister said ScotRail's first remedial plan was the last chance saloon. Since then, as the First Minister says, passengers suffered utter chaos at Waverley Station on the last day of the Edinburgh Festival. In last month's ScotRail performance figures were actually the worst for August since the franchise began. A franchise that frankly has been breached by ScotRail three times on this First Minister's watch. No wonder 79% of SNP voters want ScotRail returned to public ownership. But it's now time for a decision from the First Minister. The government must begin the process this month either to renew the Abelio franchise until 2025 or stand up for passengers and agree to bring it to an end at its first expiry date in 2022. So which will it be, First Minister? Will you end this failing franchise at the earliest opportunity? Yes or no? First Minister. Firstly, we will continue to work uh, with ScotRail to make sure that where improvements need to be made, they are made. That is first and foremost in the interest of the travelling public. Secondly, we will take decisions about the future of the franchise in an orderly and responsible uh, manner and we'll update Parliament as we take those decisions. But I, I would say to, to Labour uh, that while Labour have talked around public ownership and public control of the railways, it's been this government that has actually acted. We acted to get the powers in this parliament, which a last Labour government blocked for years, uh, so that we now have the ability to consider public sector bids for the franchise. Uh, that is a step forward that Labour, as I say, blocked for years. But when it comes to uh, actual nationalisation of the railways, uh, we still don't have the powers in this parliament that would allow us to do that. So before we get much further into a discussion about this, I would invite Labour, do they want to join us and call for the whole powers over rail to be devolved to this parliament so that that discussion uh, becomes meaningful, not abstract? And I think I'm still waiting for an answer to that question from Labour. Richard Lyle. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. Can the First Minister give an indication of what proportion of train delays are attributable to network rail, and would she agree, as I have raised in the chamber before, that Colin Smith and his colleagues might want to heed the advice of their former transport minister and support our request to devolve the functions of network rail so that it too is answerable to the Scottish Government? First Minister. Well, Richard Lyle raises a really important point here that I know the other parties don't want to address. Where, where problems, and there are plenty of them, are the responsibility of ScotRail, we need to deal with that uh, and resolve those problems. That is our responsibility, and we take that responsibility seriously. But if you take the last few months, more than half of all delays on the ScotRail network have been the responsibility of Network Rail, which doesn't report to me or to the Transport Minister in this Parliament. It reports to the UK Secretary of State. 
So if we have, are to have the same ability uh, to resolve problems with network rail as we do with Scott Rail, we need to make sure that all of these powers lie with this parliament. I don't know why opposition parties would continue to oppose that. And then when we have that, we can also have more meaningful discussions about the long-term future and ownership of the railway network. So again, I say to Labour, it's an open door. Come with us. We'll go together to the Tories uh, at Westminster and demand powers for railways to be completely devolved to this parliament. And Jamie Green. Thanks, uh, Presiding Officer. It's, it's a shame that the First Minister wasn't at the Rural Economy Committee yesterday, where she would have learned actually that the Managing Director of Scott Rail already has these additional devolved powers that you've been calling for. Uh, maybe you would have reflected upon your answer before responding to Mr Lyle. Given that the events, given that the events in Edinburgh Given that the events in Edinburgh uh, over the summer, I think were an absolute disgrace to passengers that use ScotRail, isn't it the case that it's the Transport Minister that should take responsibility for ensuring that there's greater cooperation between the rail companies, between the police and the local authorities when managing these big events? And it's his responsibility to ensure that this doesn't happen again. First Minister. Of course. We take responsibility for making sure we work with ScotRail to make sure that passengers are not let down in the way that I agree they were at the end of the Edinburgh Festival. But it is simply a statement of fact that Network Rail reports to UK ministers, not to ministers in this parliament. And I think it would make sense to have those powers uh, fully uh, joined up. And in relation to his first comment, um, I'm happy to come to his committee any time you want to invite me and talk about these or any other matters. Oh, so there you go. What an offer. Thank you. And on that contentional note, we conclude First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Kenneth Gibson on Doors Open Day 2019. But we'll just take a few moments, in fact, we'll suspend shortly uh, to allow members to change seats and the gallery to also change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>